Ennis Main is a 2022 British folk horror written and directed by Cornish filmmaker Mark Jenkin, starring the talented and prolific television character actor Mary Woodvine, and co-starring Edward Rowe, who, if you are from Cornwall, you will know as the Kerno King. Kerno King here now, here in the project, making pasties. And if you are an avid gamer, may recognise from his vocal performance in From Software's Elden Ring. Upon my name as Godfrey, the first Elden Lord. That, my friends, is range. If you have watched any of my videos before, you will know that I tend not to recount the plot, or overly explain the films or TV shows I'm talking about, instead focusing on the themes and ideas I think they raise. This video will be a little different, a little more explainy. Partly because I don't think you can separate the themes from any other elements of this film, and partly because I just want to. So, big spoiler warning for Ennis Main. Firstly, you will notice that I'm calling it Ennis Main and not Ennis Men, although I think there is a point in it possibly being both, but I'll come back to that later. But for now, it's Ennis Main, with Ennis being the word for island in Kernoic the Cornish language, and main meaning stone, so the title in Cornish means Stone Island, describing both the craggy island on which Ennis Main is set, and being the name of the island itself. The abandoned island of Ennis Main. In terms of the literal plot of Ennis Main, well, it barely has one. Mary Woodvine's unnamed character, credited as the Volunteer, lives alone on a secluded rocky island, and every day she walks the barren and deserted land, drops a rock down a disused mine shaft, looks at a flower, and then writes down her findings in a logbook. And that's pretty much it. That is, as much as it can be explained, the entire plot of this film. Other things happen, but you would be hard pressed to describe them as plot. And I think they lend themselves better to other readings anyway, so again, we will come back to those later. This is not a narrative film. There is little dialogue, and what there is is perfunctory, mundane, and largely meaningless. I thought you weren't supposed to pick them. I didn't. It is instead a film trading in symbolism and imagery, not telling a viewer its story, but demanding the viewer infers the story. Trying to make sense of the plot on a literal level serves little purpose and, you could argue, completely misses the point of the film. Just as the film is set on a largely barren island, you will find little on its surface, and instead will need to dig deeper to truly understand what is happening here. So let's chip away at this self-described stone island and see what we find buried beneath Ennis Main. The way in which Ennis Main will work best for most viewers is as a character study, a window into a mind. This is a film so obviously working on that level, so clearly functioning entirely as metaphor, that you could even argue that, as much as anything in the film is taking place, it is debatable as to whether this film is actually set on a secluded island at all, or whether that itself is a metaphor. It is an island deliberately presented as unreal foliage seeming to sway too fast in the wind, and waves seeming to retreat from the jagged, unwelcoming shore rather than lapping against it. The main thread we are given to tug on as an audience is a standing stone at the centre of the island. In the closest the film gets to a concession to narrative clarity, we are led to draw a comparison between the lonely rock and a stone memorial to fishermen lost at sea that is mentioned in a radio broadcast, playing in the background of one scene. A picture shown on the volunteer's wall also seems to lead us in this direction, depicting the standing stone being paralleled, stretching not just to the sky but deep into the ground, to where the dead rest. This is a memorial to those lost but not forgotten. Initially we see the stone in the distance, but as the film progresses it slowly creeps closer to the volunteer's home, until it appears in the doorway, all-encompassing, blocking any chance of exit. In the film's final shots, we see what could be interpreted as the volunteer becoming that monument, 
But I think the conclusion we are supposed to draw is not that she becomes it, but that she was that standing stone all along. And that is the narrative this film depicts. A woman who has given up her life to be a monument to her grief. She has isolated herself away from the world, refusing to engage with those around her. When you do that, you may not actually be on an island, but you may as well be. You are the island. A hostile and unwelcoming coastline that doesn't simply not have much contact with the outside world, but actively discourages it. Others may try to reach you, but ultimately they accept that you want that distance. Come here. Come here, mate. Just to let you know, she'll be with you by the end of the week. Weather permitted. Over and out. Accept, or are discouraged by, the barriers you put up around yourself. Accept the terms on which contact has to be made. Or accept that contact is not desired. At all. Are you lonely? Not really. You keep yourself busy, pottering away your days with tasks that have to be completed. A routine that looks ludicrous to the outside world. Busy work that becomes the centre of your life. The most important work there can be. Because what else is there? Your only company flashes of half-forgotten or repressed memories. Intrusive thoughts that break through the reality you have constructed for yourself, haunting you like ghosts. And these ghosts, narratively, hold the key to what the volunteer grieves. The girl, disobedient, obdurate, until an accident or possibly an attempt to take her own life, reveals the source of the scars the volunteer wears. She mourns for her youth and the moment her innocence died. The priest, well, he could represent lost faith, not just in the sense that you no longer believe in God, but also in losing the community given by the church. And also, the actor playing the priest is John Woodvine, the father of Mary Woodvine, who plays the volunteer. Maybe a metatextual representation of family, unable to break through. Maybe trying to use religion to reach you. The flower could perhaps represent the volunteer herself, or a part of herself, not growing, not changing, not cared for, simply existing. Edward Rose Boatman is perhaps the most important, and I think this is her husband, one of those who drowned at sea. When he visits her, delivering the supplies that enable her secluded existence, I see this not as an actual visit from her husband, or a memory intruding on her hermetic life, but a visit from an old friend of the couple, someone from her old life. But when he visits, all she can see is her dead husband. He could be anyone. But to her, his face is nothing but a reminder of what she has lost. And when she turns to stone at the end, that represents what her life truly is. She doesn't grieve, she doesn't feel, and that is the point of her whole existence. She is the island of stone. She is the Ennis Main, an inscrutable object beyond the understanding of anyone who comes across it. Any meaning it once had, lost, in the winds of time. But I've skipped a big part of the film here, haven't I? The miners, the fisherman. Does she grieve for coal? Well, actually, maybe. Because the film, to me, isn't simply a metaphorical interpretation of one woman lost to grief. There is another layer here, deeper beneath the surface, as there always was with the folk horror this film is aping. But this is going to have to take a little segue, so bear with me as we dig a little deeper. Before we go on, let's first look at the style of filmmaking on display in Ennis, Maine. It was filmed using outdated period equipment, immediately harkening back to the 1970s, with its film grain and aspect ratio perhaps putting you in mind of a long-forgotten BBC nature documentary. But very quickly it becomes apparent that this is in tribute to the folk horror of the 60s and 70s, particularly that which appeared on children's television at that time, leaning heavily on 1969's resolutely weird The Owl Service, and directly cribbing imagery from 1977's significantly less weird, but still undoubtedly odd, The Children of the Stones. The popularity of these types of stories in that time period wasn't simply because television writers decided that paganism was suddenly cool, 
but actually because stories of paganism, dying ancient traditions and nature fighting back against modernity, contextually played with themes that became relevant as the post-World War II economic boom came to an end. It was a time of polarisation not just between young and old or those of different class, but geographical, more than the fabled North-South divide, but between larger metropolitan areas, particularly London and the rest of the country. It was this extreme polarisation in the United Kingdom that 70s UK folk horror reflected. These were stories of rebellious youth clashing with old traditions. No, people like you have always stood in the way of progress or privileged outsiders running afoul of rural communities, with paganism often standing in for either a declining Christianity or the more permissive culture replacing it. And they were awash with subtext, be that class, man's impact on the environment, or sexuality, reflecting the times they sprang from. That enabled this type of horror to very much have its cake and eat it, eking horror not just from the unease that a metropolitan viewer may feel about these isolated communities and their apparently strange customs, a fear of folk, but also drawing on fears in smaller communities of modernity taking away their livelihoods, often represented by middle-class interlopers with no respect for their way of life. Ennis Main hasn't simply used this as an aesthetic choice. It is not simply to evoke nostalgia from the, frankly, rather small number of people who remember these programs fondly. It has the dual function of telling you that, like these programs, this will be media trading heavily in subtext, and to give this film a sense of not just place, but time. Which is not to say I think this film is actually set in the 1970s. The film explicitly tells us that it isn't, and is in fact set 50 years after 1973. This adds to the narrative I described in the last section, giving us a sense of a life that has been put on hold. A story that may be happening now, but is about someone living in the past. But I think there is more to it than that. A similar technique was used in Mark Jenkins' earlier film, 2019's Bait, a film that is set in the present day, but uses an obsolete camera to take on the look of a different time. It tells the story of a struggling fisherman, Roe again, and brilliant here. At odds with his brother who uses their deceased father's fishing boat to give a guided tours of the Cornish coast to drunken tourists and an upper-middle-class family who now own the harbour-front cottage the fisherman once called home, and use it as a holiday retreat. The film style initially seems to be recalling 1950s kitchen sink dramas, again a genre that traded heavily in social commentary and class analysis, before giving way to Bergman-inspired magical realism. Much like Ennis Main is deliberately filmed on outdated equipment to recall a specific atmosphere and time, in Bait this is used to convey that although this is a contemporary setting, this is a place out of time, a place that has been left behind. And that is where we need to talk about Mark Jenkins' home, Cornwall. Cornwall is one of the most beautiful places in the UK home to the stunning Lost Gardens of Heligan, the almost fairy tale like St. Michael's Mount, and Charlestown, which you may recognise as the backdrop to the Poldark TV series. Cornwall always relied on its natural resources for its primary industries, tin mining, fishing, and the quarrying of China clay, slate, and granite. But these industries have been in steady decline throughout the 20th century. This has led to Cornwall, once a hub of industry, in 2018 finding itself as the second poorest area measured by average wage in the whole of Northern Europe, with a 2016 study finding that over a quarter of children in Cornwall lived in poverty, and the region has one of the highest rates of homelessness per capita in the UK, a number matched almost exactly by the number of holiday lets, properties that lay idle for much of the year. Jenkins' bait addresses exactly this issue, specifically the gentrification of coastal areas, where the best housing, formerly convenient homes for the fishermen who drove the economies of these small coastal towns, are now desirable second homes for well-off upper-middle-class families, creating a local economy that is effectively seasonal and reliant on tourists. But you came here for a video about Ennis, Maine, so how does this all fit together? 
I've already explained that Ennis, Maine can be directly translated as Stone Island, but by this point I'm sure you're aware that I think a text can hold multiple meanings simultaneously. And in that spirit, Ennis can equally be taken to mean land, the men and women who worked this land. Miners, fishermen, balmains, gone, at best, historical artefacts. At worst, ghosts of a time when Cornwall thrived. A time long since gone. Where bait was a howl of anger, Ennis Main is breaking down and crying. Grieving. Because it isn't just the volunteer who finds herself isolated and alone. It is Cornwall. And Ennis Main is not simply a window into the world of a grieving widow. It is a film that grieves for Cornish industry. For when Cornwall had a community and a culture of its own, and was more than a secluded tourist location, its unique magic buried beneath layers of stone. But moving past a loss is not done by forgetting, by putting your life on hold and blocking out the outside world. It is done through remembering what was lost and celebrating it. Perhaps channeling that grief into art. Art that serves as a reminder of what was lost. Art that will stand forever and be appreciated not just now, but by future generations. Art like Mark Jenkins. Ennis May. Thank you very much for watching. I appreciate if you're listening to this as it means you've made it all the way to the end. If you or anyone you know has suffered a bereavement and are struggling, please take care of yourself or them. If you're in the UK, you can find free resources to help at mind.org.uk. If you have a different take on Ennis Main to me, I'd uh, love to hear your thoughts. Please feel free to comment below and I'll try to get back to you as and when I can. If you enjoyed this, please like and share the video, and if you want to see more of this sort of content, please subscribe to the channel. All of your support is very much appreciated. And to all my Cornish friends, Kerno Bisviken, and thanks for watching.